thank you all for coming and thank you for the presentation. So welcome everybody to expressive and fast data frames in Python with Polars. I tend to talk a little bit too much and I do want you to ask questions and have some discussion. So I will try to be quick. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. And I'm going to do a bit of an introduction, uh, first of all. And we're going to talk very briefly about uh, Pandas, its success, but also some of its uh, limitations. And then uh, we're going to mention very briefly what are the alternatives of, or some of the alternatives that are available these days. And then we're going to see an actual analysis uh, carried out using uh, Polars and uh, those and conclusions. So just to reintroduce uh, myself, I'm former developer advocate at, at Redox. I'm currently working as a data scientist advocate at Orchest, which is a company creating an open source pipeline orchestrator um, that we're going to see very briefly during the demo. Um, currently, uh, we're looking into ways to accelerate the solidarity economy through, through technology, in case uh, anyone is interested. Um, quitting Twitter, so feel free to join Mastodon and follow me there. I'm cross-posting in both places. Um, happy to connect with folks on GitHub and LinkedIn as well. So first of all, the context of why are we giving this talk. So at Orcas, our mission is to empower data scientists and data engineers uh, by developing uh, an easy-to-use pipeline orchestrator. And we identified that at few use cases and we were asking ourselves whether our users were using the best tools available in particular for uh, data manipulation, um, for, for tabular data in particular. So we started focusing a little bit on uh, data frame uh, libraries and we wrote a series of blog posts which evolved into uh, this talk today. So first of all, Pandas, who has used Pandas already? Nice. Okay, so lots of people. It's uh, very widely known, and it totally reflects this uh, plot that we see here. So, for those of you that don't know it, this uh, visualization comes from a Stack Overflow blog post from 2017 that was describing or analyzing how come Python had uh, skyrocketed from like a normal uh, language in 2010, at the beginning of 2010, to the most like the language with the largest number of questions in Stack Overflow, right? And if you break that down into uh, different projects and tags, you see that uh, sure Django and Flask has, they have had sort of a steady increase. And I would be super happy to see this plot again with like Fast API or some of the newer frameworks. But the most important contributing factor to this increase has been clearly the PyData and the scientific Python ecosystem, and in particular, uh, Pandas, right? So it's everywhere, many people use it, and it's been a super successful project. However, it has some um, limitations. So there is a blog post called The 10 Things I Hate About Pandas, written by the Pandas creator, that uh, analyzes a little bit what are some of the bottlenecks that uh, Pandas has. Uh, nowadays. I don't want to uh, e extend myself too long because we happen to have Jeff Reback, uh, the lead Pandas maintainer, talking about um, the past, present, and future of Pandas. So I highly encourage you to attend his talk. But basically, we can summarize these uh, bottlenecks in, in, in two categories, right? So on one hand, most Pandas operations don't take advantage of multi-core. This has been evolving and uh, there has been many people um, re-implementing or refactoring Pandas so that more and more operations take advantage of uh, multi-core, but it's not uh, complete by any chance. And even when it's complete, the fact that Pandas is eagerly evaluated, and therefore when you have a chain of operations, imagine the typical filtering and group by and aggregation and so forth, each of these objects um, have to uh, be stored in Python memory, and therefore there's not much room for ahead of time query optimization, right? And then on the other hand, some of the design decisions of Pandas have affected how the memory is managed uh, and so forth. And for example, the way missing data is implemented in Pandas, uh, well, it looked good at the time, but now 
there have been people uh, saying that it would have been better to have like a um, mask array approach. So have uh, basically a mask array that says which are the valid values, right? And then uh, the values themselves, which needs twice as much memory, but uh, probably uses much more the, the CPU. And several other things like how strings are implemented and so forth. Uh, but again, I refer you to Jeff Rayback's talk, uh, which I'm sure is going to be super interesting. And I would like to clarify that I'm not throwing shade at Pandas because I love it. It's a wonderful project and it's not going anywhere. But I would like to talk a little bit about the alternatives. So if you are like me six months ago, you have probably heard about many different projects that are kind of like Pandas, but not exactly, or like they deviate in some ways. So the first thing I did was trying to map uh, all these alternatives, and inspired by the famous uh, Gardner uh, infographics, I created the Data Frames Charming Quadrangle, and uh, released with a Creative Commons uh, license for all of you. And so we basically have this uh, landscape, right? On the top, on the bottom left corner, we have Pandas itself, and uh, Rapids, which is a, sort of a Pandas implementation on GPUs, right? So it's still for sort of small-ish uh, data frames or data frames that fit in RAM, right? But uh, some of the operations are much, much faster thanks to them leveraging the GPU. Then on the top left corner, we have uh, Dask. Again, we have uh, Matthew Rockling talking about deploying Dask uh, later on in this conference. So if you're interested, check it out. And which take pandas to the distributed uh, world, right? So this allows us to uh, use essentially the same pandas APIs, but with data frames that are much larger than RAM. And then you have other projects like Modding, for example, that try to make the, uh, the process of switching to a distributed uh, uh, setting much more easy, and the promise of modding is that if you change one line of code, just the import statement, then everything works. Um, on the top right cor corner, I have this uh, category that I call recovering Hadoopers, um, because I don't really have any experience with uh, Apache Spark, so I don't have anything meaningful to say. It's kind of weird because we have all these uh, projects, right, uh, trying to um, uh, accelerate Python, for large scale data processing, but then PySpark has been there for a very long time. And I think there's just like an historical divide that the communities are kind of uh, different and they overlap only a little bit. But definitely Spark is used by lots of uh, entities already and it's worth uh, checking out as well. And finally, on the bottom right corner, we have new projects that don't necessarily uh, try to solve all your needs for huge uh, data processing, but they deviate from the Pandas API in some interesting and very meaningful ways. So if you want to, sorry, if you want to know a little bit more in depth about Arrow itself or VEX, I recommend you to check out uh, another talk that I gave earlier this year that is recorded. But for the remainder of the presentation, we're going to focus on polars, which for me is one of the most interesting ones. So first, a little bit of background. What is uh, Arrow? Who knows Arrow here? OK, so most um, of the people. Who is aware of using Arrow at the moment? OK, so not many people using it consciously, at least. So well, Arrow is this language independent uh, memory format uh, that has bindings for many different languages, right? We have PyArrow on Python, which is based on the C++ implementation, but there's a Rust implementation as well that I'm going to mention in a moment, and many others. So it strives to be a cross-language uh, foundation. And the interesting thing is that by having this common in-memory representation, you can transfer data between uh, languages uh, very easily, you can stream it over a socket or something like that, so it's uh, really, really powerful. Um, I, uh, I wouldn't say this is like a replacement of a data frame library because it's quite low level, um, but it's no doubt becoming like a foundation for the next generation of data frame libraries. 
And then there's Polars. Who has used Polars already before this talk? So there's a handful of people. Okay, so you're at the right place. Um, so Polars um, describes itself as an in-memory, lightning fast data frame library for Rust and Python. So most of the business logic is written in Rust on top of the Rust Arrow implementation, but it happens to have a Python layer too, and both uh, are developed uh, hand in hand. The latest version was released three days ago. They release a lot of versions uh, very often uh, because the project is uh, quite young. And so I highly recommend you to check the change logs. And the interesting thing that we're going to see in the demo part is that it has a lazy expression system that sort of decouples the computation from the data itself. So you can express what operations do you want to perform on the columns and then apply those to a particular uh, data frame or whatever. And the fact that this is a lazy expression allows spotters to optimize the, the query ahead of time and to try to use as much um, as the, the resources of the computer as much as possible. Um, so that was a, a bit of an introduction to, uh, to Polars, and I want to uh, comment that if you're in this talk, you will probably enjoy some of the other uh, talks that are happening um, this, uh, this couple of days. So I, as I said, I have a recording about, um, of a, an earlier version of this talk where I talk about, about Pyarrow and Vex. Um, you might have heard of DuckDB, which is uh, um, SQL in-memory SQL database for analytics. That is super interesting. So if you're like a SQL person, I recommend you to check this uh, blog post that I wrote um, that combines DuckDB and Polars in interesting ways. And then there's a, a tutorial on Friday about Fugue. I don't know if the Fugue people are in the room. Yes. So. Make sure to check that out. It's like it's not a data frame library per se, but it's a unified interface on top of Spark, Dask, Ray, and then there's Ibis too. And we have again right after this talk in the other room uh, a talk called Ibis Expressive Analytics in Python at any scale. So um, make sure to check all this out. Ooh. Okay, so that was uh, 15 minutes. So I am on time, and we have plenty of time for demo. So I'm going to verify that everything works. There we go, you can see the screen, right? Yes. Okay, so, well, I set up a tiny Orcas project to download a data set from Kaggle that contains, a, I think it's a 1% sample of all the Stack Overflow questions uh, and their tags, as we're going to see. And my objective is to analyze uh, this data set and try to figure out uh, what are the top Python questions and what questions do have Python among the, talk, the tags and all of that. So I'm going to make sure that um, all the steps are behaving correctly, which they should, hopefully. So there we go, we have the data and I'm going to get in here and to not spoil the talk, I removed all the output, but uh, I prefer uh, the code to not make it uh, a super risky uh, live demo, right? Because the live demo gods are not always uh, super kind to me. Um, so the way to import polars is this, uh, import polars as PL, and as I said, we have um, a couple of CSV files, and uh, the tags one is uh, quite manageable, but then the one with the questions contains the body of the question and the title and so forth, so it's uh, quite big. It's 1.8 uh, gigabytes. And the machine I'm doing this in, it's not particularly powerful. And in fact, if I try to load the data set twice, it's going to completely crash the server. And I'm not going to try that, uh, so trust me on that. But uh, this is just to prove that I don't necessarily need a super powerful machine to uh, crunch uh, two gigabytes of data. So Polars has a read CSV function, uh, same name as the one we know and love from Pandas, 
And what this returns is uh, Polar's data frame objects that has some um, uh, convenience methods as well as in Pandas. So it has a dot head uh, method that we can use. And this displays the first five rows of the data set. We can check that the type of the DF is Polar's data frame. And the first thing we notice here is that, well, this looks like a, uh, a representation of a data frame that we would expect, but um, um, we see the, the D types of each of the columns here, and we're going to see later on when we uh, manipulate this a little bit more that the types that are available in Polars are a little bit more sophisticated than what we have right now uh, in Pandas. So I'm also going to load the tags uh, CSV, and as you can see, I only have the ID of the question and the tag itself. So naturally, there can be more than one tag per question, so the ID might be repeated. And in total, we have 1 million, 1.2 million rows for the questions and 3.7 um, million tags uh, in total. Okay, so. Not too crazy, also to keep the, the times, the processing times reasonable for this demo. Um, but needs to be handled with care, right? Um, the estimated size in memory for this, sorry about the audio thing, I don't know why it's, that, that happened. Um, so the estimated size of this in memory, it's uh, 1.8 uh, gigabytes um, right now. One silly thing that I really like about Polars is that you have this ASCII representation of the data frame if you use print, which is uh, super good for copy-pasting uh, in, in certain cases. And we also have a describe method that gives us some um, uh, information. And I can even do some simple processing like checking which are the tags globally, the tags that are most uh, widely used, right? So value counts does the same as pandas, and then I'm sorting these by counts. Uh, descending order and displaying only the first one. So I get that uh, JavaScript, of course, is the tag that is uh, most uh, widely used. Then Java, C Sharp, PHP, Android, probably below here it's uh, Python, right? So, so far so good, but then um, the interesting thing about Polars, as I said, is the expression system. So we're going to check that out. And the idea is that we have this pl.call, so uh, a column function that represents a column of a data frame without actually using the data frame. So as you can see here, my data frame is df, but in this cell, I'm nowhere using that df. So this is a generic representation of the median of the score, right? And then I can apply this to any data frame that I have. The way I do that is by using the select method of the data frame itself. So I have the select method and then I pass an expression. See this uh, 15 is an expression and then I pass that to select and it gives me the result, right? So the median, the mean score of uh, all the questions is 1.78. Um, which is not unexpected, right? So most of the questions have like one upvote because nobody saw that, and then some of them have two, and there's like a long tail of scores. Interestingly, when I pass a list of expressions, then all of these are going to be computed in parallel. So I have, for example, the number of unique IVs and the mean score again, but also the maximum length of all the titles and by passing all these expressions as a list, uh, since they are all independent from each other, because I don't need to have the length of the titles uh, to compute the number of unique IDs, Polars is going to leverage all the uh, cores of the machine to make this as fast as possible. And I can do even do something like this, which is select all the columns of type UTF-8 and compute the lengths and then give me the maximum of that, so I have the length, the maximum length of all the columns that have a UTF-8 uh, D-type, which is quite powerful. 
Sorry, I was a little bit too fast. Any questions or comments so far? Yes. If you have a problem with a mixed data type, you know, pandas will render that as an object, and it's up to you to kind of fix it. Is it is Polars going to be more picky? So exactly, this is what I'm going to show in a moment. Um, but the idea is that, uh, a, as you say, a pandas object data type is quite generic, right? Most of the times it contains a string but it could be like a list of numbers or virtually any other object, right? So it's uh, sometimes not really useful, but thanks to Arrow, Polars can identify, for example, if a given column is a list of strings, for example, or even a struct, because it has the notion of, of uh, objects with different properties within a given column as well. So we, have, we definitely have more granularity, and we're going to see an example of that in a moment. Thank you very much. Yes. Can you do wait code operations? I think so, yes. I don't remember that by heart, but there's a wonderful, okay, this is worth uh, checking. There's a wonderful Polar's book, sort of a, a long um, user guide. There's a window functions. And this one is quite useful. It contains lots of examples and walks you through uh, several things you might want to check out uh, with Polar's. Um, better that. Um, and it has a reference guide as well that contains like all the methods, all the functions, and so forth. This one is uh, a little bit difficult to navigate. They exist in different uh, websites, by the way. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, yes, we have uh, window functions, window aggregations, and so forth. Oops. Anything else? Okay, so let me continue. Um, and this is when I'm going to start uh, showing some more interesting things because I don't know if it hap if it happens to you, but in pandas, especially when you're reading like JSON data, for example, or doing some certain aggregations and groupings, when you end up with a column of lists like a, a column that contains lists of elements, it's not very uh, handy to work with that uh, in pandas. And you have to use like the dot, dot .str methods, which is not very intuitive either. Um, so it turns out that in Polars there's a dedicated namespace for arrays and lists of objects. So you have the dot .str methods, as, as I was showing here, like the length or something like that. But you also have dot r dot uh, lengths, which is something that you can use for a column that happens to be a list. And, but before I get there, um, let's talk a little bit about lazy uh, evaluation here. So, um, the questions data frame is quite large, as uh, you show, and it turns out that if I want to join the questions data set, that was it. <laughs> so if I try to join the questions data set with the tags to know what tags correspond to each question, right? And I'm going to run out of RAM. I'm not gonna try it because it's going to ruin my presentation forever, but um, you can try this at home if you have some spare time. And so what would be the way to do this, right? And the answer is that uh, by default, Polars has uh, this uh, eager evaluation. So every intermediate step is going to return a Polars object. But it also has a lazy evaluation mode that it's quite easy to use. So uh, after a data frame that it's already in memory, then you put this dot lazy method and all the operations that you do after that are going to become lazy. So they are not being evaluated just yet. And for example, in this case, I'm joining with also a lazy version of the tags data frame on the column ID, and I'm doing a semi-join, which is a magical thing that I didn't see in Pandas, um, that does like an inner join, but discards some extra columns. I still don't understand, don't fully understand how it works, but uh, it feels great. <laughs> and, and I'm filtering only uh, those rows where the lowercase tag contains the word Python, okay? So I'm uh, keeping only these questions, sorting by ID ascending, 
And to go from a lazy chain of operations to the actual data frame, then you call dot .collect at the end, which is quite similar to how one would do things in like Dask or something like that. And you end up with this. So I do have um, the questions here. Yes, and I'm, since I'm doing a semi-join, the tag uh, column doesn't actually appear here but I'm filtering uh, the questions that have that tag over there. Uh, this, I left a note to myself to restart the kernel here because otherwise uh, I will run out of memory. So I'm restarting here. And I'm going to, um, instead of reading the whole questions data frame to memory, I'm going to do something else. So instead of doing a read CSV and then a dot lazy, right, that allows me to write a lazy chain of operations but on a data frame that already exists in memory, I'm going to do something else, and I'm going to use scan CSV. So a scan CSV does not read the whole data frame in memory, but it kind of points to it, and then when you do, and it returns a lazy data frame instead of a in-memory data frame, right? So it's better than calling read CSV dot lazy because I'm not actually reading that uh, completely, and I'm essentially doing uh, the same operations, um, but storing the chain of operations in a separate variable. And the cool thing about this separate variable is that um, you can also visualize when this is done after a few seconds, you can also visualize how Polars is optimizing this chain of operations internally. So you end up with uh, plots like this. I'm not sure why um, I don't know, the Polar's authors wrote all these uh, mathematical symbols uh, at the beginning. I guess it means like number of partitions or something like that. I haven't uh, done a lot of research on that. But at least we see that we're joining two data frames and we're filtering, then uh, sorting and so forth. So if our chain of operations becomes too complex, then Polar's hopefully will be able to merge some of those operations and optimize them somehow. And what time is it? Okay, so we have 10 minutes left. Um, so now to the original question that I asked myself, right? So what are the top uh, Python questions? Well, it turns out that um, I have more tags than questions, right? So I had to join this uh, somehow. And what I'm going to do is to turn uh, each of the rows of the tags into a single row per question where I have the list of tags like this. And the way I'm doing that is by using this um, field called tag.list. Okay, so I'm grouping by ID, and then each ID group, I'm turning the tags into an actual list. So rather than aggregating, I'm like concatenating all these tags to come up with a tag list column. And as I was saying a few minutes ago, you see the D type of that is list of strings. So Polars knows that this is not just an object, it's a list of strings and it has its own set of operations. Um, and after I have the list of tags, um, I was kind of amazed that I could do this. So essentially I have this dot r dot eval that takes an expression that I'm passing and then it's evaluating that for each of the elements of the list for each of the rows, right? So for every element, I'm asking whether the lowercase version of that contains Python, and finally, if any of those is true, basically. So I'm saying, okay, for every row, tell me which ones contain the contain a tag that contains the substring Python, right? Because there could be Python 3 or Python dash something something, so it's not enough to check for equality. And it turns out that it works, okay, so all of these don't have Python in the list of tags, but then Python bash multiline does have it, and so forth. Then I shared this with Richie, the author of Polars in the Discord server, and told me, no, but that's too complex, you can do that in two lines. <laughs> and without using the tags list uh, intermediate, intermediate thing, I just left the other code because, I don't know, it just looks beautiful that you can do that. Uh, but, yes, you can have the tag list and you can say, okay, for every tag, uh, let me know if it contains the substring Python and then uh, turn that into uh, another column, right? 
with the um, with the group by and aggregation we were using before. Um, and I think this is almost the end. Yes. So now what I'm doing is repeating again the scan CSV. I'm joining with the tag list that I have uh, that tells me whether a question contains a tag that contains the word Python, filtering that, and then sorting them by score and limiting the first uh, thousand of them. So at the very end, when this is done, I will be able to select um, like all the columns except uh, the body, like I'm doing here, and then displaying the uh, most uh, highly voted uh, Python questions. Let's give this a few more seconds, hoping that the machine doesn't die. Yes, there we go. So we have all the questions containing Python here, and I'm going to increase the width over here a little bit. So config set. So how do I randomly select an item from a list that happens to be the most highly voted Python question? Manually raising, throwing an exception in Python. These are right, quite old, right? Like 2008, 2010. Um, makes total sense, right? Like all the questions have more upvotes. Um, but yeah, that's it. So happy that nothing broke. And uh, if there are any follow-up questions before I move to the conclusions? Yes. And to not run out of memory, basically, because when like reading the whole questions data frame in memory is possible. Like I have slightly more than two gigabytes of RAM, but then when you want to join that with something else, it was happening to me that it was crashing. So I'm using that to basically go beyond what the RAM of my machine would allow. Yes, and one follow up to that before, it turns out that and one month ago, Richie implemented what he called streaming uh, support and managed to churn like 80 gigabytes of CSV uh, on a machine with 16 gigabytes of RAM, which is impressive. I didn't want to test that um, because I think that would be too dangerous for a live demo, but uh, apparently it worked and I'm looking forward to use it. Yes? What about Dask? Um, maybe it's closer than you think. So this is a screenshot that I took today, so nine days ago today. Matthew Rockling uh, in uh, an issue that someone opened asking what about Dask, said, well, uh, we have a prototype like Dask on top of Polars. And basically, he's sourcing feedback from the community to understand what are the use cases and so forth. So. Um, the key point here is that Polars started as an uh, in-memory data frame library, very similar to Pandas, right? Now it has gone a little bit beyond that, so it can do out-of-core computation and therefore load data frames that are larger than RAM. But to take this to a huge distributed setting, um, you will probably need some orchestration and things like that. And I would say that Dask plus Polars is going to be uh, the answer that we're looking for. Hope that answers the question. Kind of? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, focusing on the benefit, the lazy benefit of having less data that you're trying to join or otherwise, can you compare with just in pandas, taking a random sample of those data sets and joining a pandas purely and help? So a, a random sample, but why do, why do you mean a random sample? To get the same results? Like if you have or? a massive CSV and you just uh, use a CSV library to take some of the rows of that file and then just use it for pandas and do the same thing. I guess for like some aggregate statistics, like the median score or something like that, would be perfectly fine to sample in a smart way, though. I'm not a statistician, so I would probably do it wrong. But uh, uh, 
would be okay to sample, but in this case, since I'm trying to get the most highly voted questions, I guess I had to use the whole data frame anyway, uh, unless I'm missing something. So um, for the use cases where you actually need like all the data or something like that, resorting to an alternative that is a little bit faster uh, could go a long way. Yes. When would you not run a use case if you think uh, since like you're assuming that there are thousand nodes in your organization, is it never worth it? Mm, when you're sure that like the data frames you're using are small, for example, I was doing a small analysis at home of some data that I scrapped from a website, and it was a bunch of rows, I don't know, hundreds of rows or something like that, and I didn't bother doing the dot lazy dot collect um, because it's also slightly faster and probably easier to debug uh, as well. Like I expect the errors to be less cryptic, probably. Um, but yeah, apart from that, when you know that the data set is going to be huge, probably I would use the lazy interface every time. So if you're using the lazy evaluation, I don't know how would that work. If you're using the eager one, then probably you can sort of kind of bisect uh, where your, your problems are coming, right? And there's also a way to tell for us to not to optimize the query planning, just in case that happens to be some sort of bottleneck or, or mistake in the optimization. So there's a couple of escape hatches, but I haven't yet used this in, in production for like a Right, because it's possible that the optimizer actually makes it so that I think it would work if you did it in like a DAG, like a shorter DAG, but not in a lazy uh, like DAG. Right, right. Yes. So, um, I don't remember if there's like a direct SQL interface. But for example, you can connect to several databases uh, using this connector X library um, or PsychoPG2. But if you want to run SQL on um, a file, I definitely recommend you to check DuckDB. That's uh, exactly what you're looking for. Okay, I think I'm, I ran out of uh, time already, so. Real quick, uh, what about the index? There's no index anywhere. James Powell is upset, and I can understand. So does it matter? I'm not sure, but it's worth discussing anyway. And yeah, pandas is OK, but polar rocks. And thank you very much. And happy to connect, as I said. Thank you, everybody, and see you around. <laughs>